As you know, you're getting set up today on 62. Your essential question is why do chemical bonds form? Pages 61, 62, and your topic is ionic bonds. And as a reminder, if you want to do your retake of that periodic table test, you got until the 10th, which is today's the first, so you can do the math on that. But you got until that day. That's the memory part or the knowledge part, your call, but it needs to be done by the 10th. So time's taken away on that. Make sure that's on your list of stuff to do, please. So chemical bonds are what we're talking about today. We're going to write chemical formulas like H2O. I'll show you how to figure out that it's H2O and why it's not H3O or CO2 and why it's not CO5 or anything like that because it's not random. There's a reason for it. And why salt? You probably already know the name for or the chemical formula for table salt. No, I don't. Yeah, like regular old. Yeah, so that would be. NaCl. So I'll show you how we come up with that and why that's not NaCl2 or Na2Cl, why, how we can figure that stuff out. That's the plan for today. So first thing we're going to get down is this, and it is the reasons why things bond. Is atoms only bond for a specific reason, and that is because atoms want a full energy level on the outside. Do you remember what that outside layer, Logan, of electrons is called? No, the outside layer in the electron. Yeah. So for an atom to be stable, it's got to have a full valence shell. If it's not full, then it is an unstable atom, right? You've heard the term maybe describing a person they're not playing with a full deck. It means they're a little bit crazy. They're a little bit unstable. Maybe you know somebody like that. You've never heard that term before? No, I've never heard that. Or what's another one? Yeah. Yeah. I can't. I yeah, like a loose, whatever. But there's lots of, you know, like sayings to indicate someone's unstable. For atoms, it's really simple. The only thing that makes them unstable is when they don't have a full valence shell. In most cases, how many does it take to have a full valence shell? Eight. But in two cases, how many does it take? Two for hydrogen and helium. So if they're not full, they're unstable. If they are full, they're stable, which tells you there's only one group of elements or one family of elements on the whole periodic table that's stable. Noble gases, the ones all the way over on the right. Those are the only ones that have a full shell. And they do begin with helium. That's the, right? So just to further emphasize that point, unstable atoms do not have a full outer shell. <coughs> Good on this slide. So, unstable atoms, the ones that don't have full valence electrons, shells, are the ones that bond with other things. Right? That's what we're saying here. Unstable atoms form bonds. Those bonds result in things called compounds. It's because when they bond with another element, if you noticed it in the work you did online and then the foldable you did yesterday, they all do something with their electrons. Do you remember what atoms do with their electrons when they bond with other atoms? One word, and it starts with an S. Somebody said it. You say share? Yeah. They share electrons. And when they do that, that's how they get full electron shells, is they share electrons, and that fills up both of their shells. And there's two ways, or there's three ways they can kind of do this. Um, in order to get a full electron shell, you can lose an electron, you can gain an electron, or you can share them. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Do you guys still have your periodic tables left? Yeah. Would you find yours? Yeah. Or it's not full on the outside. So it's got these three options it can do to become stable. It can lose an electron or electrons. It can gain an electron or electrons, or it can share them. 
And it's just as easy to gain one as it is to lose one. And it's just as easy to share one as it is to gain one or lose one. So they're all like equivalent, if that makes sense. It's like if somebody asks you what's harder, running a mile or running a 1600 on the track, they're the same thing, right? It's the same, they're equivalent. So here, what's going to be easy? Well, let me tell you what's going to be easiest for this thing to do. One option is it can gain seven electrons, right? Because it needs seven more to get filled up. But that's kind of a pain because all it really needs to do is it just needs to lose that one electron, right? And now its outer shell is full if it loses one electron. You follow me there? Okay. So if it loses that one electron, you know this already because we've done this before. Does it have more electrons or protons now? More protons, and as a result, it would get a positive one charge, right? Because it's got more protons and electrons. What if you look at magnesium, which is the next one over, I think? Is that true? Okay. Would you agree that it's got two valence electrons? Okay. Easier for it to gain six or lose two. Right? Easier to do that. And when it does that, it gets a positive two charge to it. It's as simple as it gets. So if you go to the next one over, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, right? If you go to aluminum which is the next one over, that should have three valence electrons in it. It's trying to get up to eight. Easier to gain five or lose three? Easier to lose three. And as a result, aluminum gets like a plus three charge to it. And once you start to get in this range, it's easier to start sharing stuff, sharing electrons. And then finally, we can kind of slide over to all the way on the right-hand side in that row. Is it chlorine? That's not quite a noble gas, the, the halogen. So if you look at chlorine, it should have seven, right? Easier to lose seven or gain one? Easier to gain one, because that's all it's going to take to get full. And if it gains an electron, what charge would it have? You guys will have no problem at all with this, because that's, that's as hard as this is. If, that's why Bohr diagrams are so important, is for this moment right here. If you can picture this, bonding becomes really easy for you. So I'm going to have you write some numbers across the top of your periodic table on top of your families that are going to make stuff easy. Because if you look down that first family of alkali metals, the ones that are high, uh, lithium, sodium, that one, you know the one I'm talking about? Would you agree? Like they all have different numbers of layers, but no matter what, those things outer layer always has one in it. Does it make sense then that when they become stable, they are all going to have the same charge? They're all going to be a positive one. So on top of that column, you're going to put a positive one. These numbers are called oxidation numbers. So on top of that first column, you want a positive one. On top of the second column, the one that starts with, I think, beryllium's on that one, a positive two. And you're making your way over to the next one. It should be boron. That should be a positive three. And the next one that you're going to write is kind of tricky. It's either positive or negative four. It can go, we can do either one. So you're going to write plus slash minus four on the top of that one. And that should be the one, is that carbon? Okay. Nitrogen's going to get a negative three because everything in there is going to gain three electrons to get stable. Nitrogen, oxygen is going to get a negative two. You're picking up the pattern here. Fluorine, a negative one. And then uh, noble gas is a zero. What's that? Yeah, they're already stable. Those things are going to, if you've got those numbers on there, those things are going to become critical in a little bit. And it's going to save you a lot of work to kind of have those in there. That way you don't have to figure it out every time. You can just look at the top. So that should make your life a little easier here coming up. Yep. So a ton next one is what's called a chemical bond. It's your official definition for it that we've got there. And a chemical bond is a force between the positives and the negatives inside of the two atoms that hold these things together. And it kind of works, in ionic bonds at least, like a magnet. 
because we said this was chlorine, if you remember, and we said it was a minus one because it's going to gain the electron. And there's sodium. He said sodium's going to be a plus one. So this is sodium the way it appears on your table. And do you remember, is it easier for sodium to lose one or gain seven? Lose one, right? No, it can't disappear. It can't, like, just fade into nothing. So when it loses one, it tries to find something that wants one. Do you remember that chlorine had seven, and it was easier for chlorine to gain one than it was to lose seven? So really, all that happens is that electron that was out here that it doesn't want anyhow goes over here to chlorine, makes chlorine full, and then these things have their charges. Chlorine's a minus one, and that's a plus one. And what do you know about opposites? Yeah, they attract, right? And that's how these things get stuck together in the bond. That's the force that holds them together. Just like on a magnet, when you've got a positive and a negative end, they like come together and stick. What happens if you put the positive towards the positive on a magnet? That's the word, yeah, they repel. Same thing's true here. If you tried to stick a sodium next to a sodium, they would push each other apart because they can't bond together like that to form something. So that's the force that's holding these things together. Good on this one. About here. And we're just getting some of the vocab out of the way, but the word is compound. That's one of the vocab words. It doesn't look like it's in bold, but it is. When two elements combine, they form a compound. And all these things over here are compounds because they're two or more elements that are stuck together. This thing down here is called a subscript, and it only applies to the atom that it's like attached to. So that tells you there's one carbon and two oxygens. This tells you there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. Do you know any other ones other than like the ones? Say it again. Do you know any other ones that are not listed up here? Yeah. So NaCl, how many sodiums are there? And how many chlorines? Yeah, ones don't get written. Spencer? Great question. But they combine, and think of it's even a better question than that, right? Because Hydrogen, explosive. Oxygen, explosive. Put them together and they put out fires. Doesn't seem like it should work. Seems like it should be like extra bad stuff not to put on a fire. But yeah, same thing with sodium and chlorine, right? This is explosive in water. This is a poisonous gas. You put them together, you need them. It's because when you combine those things, their properties change. Gavin? Spencer was talking about just a second ago. Compounds do not have the same properties of the elements that make it up. So sodium, which if you remember is reactive when you put it in water, it's reactive because it's really trying to get rid of that electron very fast. But when you combine it with chlorine, it's no longer reactive with water. It doesn't have the same chemical reactions at all. These are just more examples of compounds that are out there. H2 is hydrogen gas, which hydrogen bonded to hydrogen. There's water, NO2, nitrogen dioxide. If you've heard of, like, laughing gas before, nitrous or whatever it's called, that's the stuff. You can, N2O, or NO2. Yes. I know exactly what you're talking about because I've seen it and I don't remember the name of the gas.